The name of this session is working with SQL Server containers on to build database solutions. Here is just a reminder slide to make sure to keep your cell phone mute, and thank you. Please make sure to check all the things that PASS has to offer. There are multiple free online resources like 24 hours of PASS, virtual groups, and there is local groups and SQL Saturday events happening somewhere around the world, okay? My name is Carlos Robles. I'm originally from Guatemala, living in the United States for the past two years. I represent my blog slash consulting company called DBA Mastery with more than 10 years of experience working in the database administration field. All right, and I have the honor to be a Microsoft Data Platform MVP also the group leader of the Guatemala SQL Server community that we run with PASS with the help of one of my guides. It's here, Carlos, thank you. <laughs> All right, so enough about me. Here's what I have prepared for you guys today. Basically, there are, there are three main topics. The first is containers, what and why, and why, excuse me. Um, a, brief a brief definition of what a container is and why containers are so good to build immutable infrastructure solutions then SQL Server as an application component will be a comparison between traditional development practices versus contemporary practices and how SQL Server fits on each one of these. And finally, SQL Server as an application component, I don't know, excuse me, SQL Server containers and CI CD pipelines. We'll take a look what is the role of these type of containers with using CI CD pipelines in Jenkins or a container platform like Kubernetes. All right, here's a few prerequisites for this session. Just wanted to point out that this is a 300 level session and there is a, the demos will have a combination of multiple technologies. So I just wanted to put it on, on the screen. Okay, so let's move on to the first topic. What are containers? They are commonly called a standard unit of software and that's because a container image can have all those binaries uh, files and everything else that will be, will be required for that container application to be functional, all right? And containers provides a really good uh, level of security and an isolation thanks to the C groups technology that runs on the background of our container platform. And most of the time, containers are really lightweight, or I mean, I said the container image is really lightweight, and that's why they are really portable. They are also cross-platform, which means that if I create a, con a container image here today, I can use it on a Linux environment, in a Windows environment, and even the cloud, like Azure. Why containers? And remember from the previous slide that I said they are standard, that means they are consistent as well. So that consistency will allow us to create predictable environments. We will know exactly what we are building. We won't have surprises. They, be because their nature, they are cloud focused. We can even have containers running on serverless uh, services like Azure Container Instances, which is really good. I have a short demo how to show you how to create one container in Azure Container Instances if you are interested in that topic. They enable us to do fast deployment through automation. We can have a dev or test environment created in just a matter of seconds, I would say, maybe minutes. And they enable us to use CI CD pipelines, and that's a perfect match because we will be working with our infrastructure the same way we work with our applications. And that's what is called infrastructure as a code. And my personal favorite, they eliminate shared environments and resource contention. And I will have a few slides to talk about this topic, this, this topic in detail. All right, so it's time to have our first demo. In this demo, I'm going to create a custom container and also a custom uh, image. And by the way, I would like to leave the questions at the end so I can cover as much as the material I have. Um, I'll be here around all week, so we can talk later if you want. All right, so let's move to the first demo. All right, so this demo actually born 
from some of the questions I have when I talk about this topic. I always get this question, Carlos, can I create a container that has a custom path for my data files? Yes, you can. Can I do it for my logs? Yes, you can. Can, you create, can I create jobs? Yes, you can have the SQL agent enabled. So there is many options you can enable when, when using SQL Server containers. And it's basically from here. You can take a look at the startup parameters for SQL Server and Linux. There is many options that works with containers. So I translate that into a container. And I will show you here what's going to happen. All right. So in case you are interested, here is a couple of commands you can use to query, if you will, the Microsoft Container Registry, which is the public repository that Microsoft has built where all the SQL Server images are host. So you can query those and check what are the versions. You can use this curl command to do it. I also include the PowerShell way. If you want to do it in PowerShell, you can. So you can take a look. That would be the very first step you want to follow when creating a, a container, right? All right, so here is the first example. Where's my mouse go? All right, so the most important part here is to take a look at my environment variables. As I said, I will manipulate this container. I want to have a separate volume for my data, one for the logs, one for the backups, and also I will have my SQL agent enable. But take a look at this. These are like my mount points. These mount points will be mapped into volumes that I will create in my local machine, all right? And also, I'm creating um, some kind of bridge between my computer and the container because I want to share backups. For example, if I want to restore a backup, I will need to put it somewhere, and I need to copy that backup from my computer to the container so I can have this directory to do whatever I want, all right? So let's create this first container, and that's it. It's done. How I, how I know it was created? Because this is some kind of ID that is returned by the Docker client when a container is created. But if you want to deep dive and check more information about your container, you can use the docker inspect command to, that will return a series of metadata that you can learn more about your container but here's a short command you can use to check the status. And you don't want to type this whole command line every time you are working with containers, right? So I have created some kind of shortcuts that you can use. It is published on SQL Server Central if you want to take a look. And there is many shortcuts that will save you some time and you, you will execute those commands instead of running this, this large command line. All right, so my container is up, up and running for the last 20 eight seconds. And something really important here about containers is that they are like a process or a program running on that host machine, remote server, or maybe cloud server where the Docker container is running, right? So containers will use as much resources from that host machine or whatever is running if you don't put quotas, all right? So let's take a look at the quotas here. It will be really interesting. I don't know if it's, you can see it there, back. All right, so the quota for this container is zero for the CPU and zero for the memory. Well, what's that? So that, that means that Docker can use as much resources it has allocated. And I don't put any limit when creating this container. That means it will use everything. And my Docker implementation here is using say, six gigabytes, all right? So if I, do something else here and take a look. There we go. This command will help you to take a look at and do some kind of monitoring to your containers and you will see how they are behaving. So I can see that my container is using 3.3 of my CPU and take a look at the memory here. It says that it's using 700 megabytes but the limit, hard limit, is six gigabytes. And it's because I configured my Docker settings this way. So that's really important when working in a stage or maybe a production environment. It doesn't matter for development, but that's something you have to keep in mind. And that will be really important when creating a container on Azure container instances. So I will show you that. 
All right, so remember about those volumes that I have created? So we can even query the metadata here. Let me kill this. And let's run this command to return me the information about my volume. So I have three volumes here. I have one for the data, one for the logs, and one for the backups. Remember, I have created one for my, for, for my files I want to copy and paste between my container and my computer. So where where they go? Well, it happens that those kind of volumes are different. Those are called bind. It is not a, an actual volume. It's just an alias or an, just a point, a link between the computers. That's something important you have to understand here. All right, so let's jump into Azure Data Studio and let's query the SQL Server properties because I am telling you this is where the data files will, data files will be, the log files will be, but it is true or not, all right? So let's query it. Let's query SQL Server. Um, Docker. Here's my first demo. All right, so I will run this query, and the query says that my instance name called demo01 has my data path, path uh, configured to use this volume. That is MS SQL underscore data, the same for logs, and the same for backup. So that proves that I have customized my container to use different volumes at will as I want it. And also here, I have my SQL Server agent up and running. Imagine the possibilities, you can do a lot. And I was able to create a, a read. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is not, this is not an AG, but it's a um, read scale implementation that you can scale up with multiple replicas and do some read-only routing of your query. So I did it with containers just, just for fun, right? Okay, so I know my my configuration is looking the way I want. So the next step will be to take a backup of production. Because I, sa I said, okay, this is looking good. Maybe I can use a container for my, my development, for example. So I will connect to my Azure database now. I have an Azure VM here. And I want to take a backup, and I will put it as 330, for example. So I will take my backup for Azure, and it's done. Obviously, this is a small database. You may want to have subsets of data to create different databases per environment, if you will. You will have your development, you will have your stage. So this is for demo purposes. This is a small, I know, but just wanted to let you know in advance. All right, so my backup is fine. It's done, complete. All right, so I should be able now to copy such backup back to my computer. So where did it go? Okay, there you go. Okay, so I have this script that I have created in advance that will do that for me. So it's going to copy that backup and it's going to download it from, from Azure. It will be really quick. Right now it's listing all the backups that I have, and this is the name of the backup file that will be put it on my computer. You can even rename it. And for some reason, all right, well, <laughs> it's done. So my backup is here. So let's take a look and make sure my container can see it. Remember about that mount point that I created, I named it share, so it's here. So the link between my computer and the container is working, so all right, cool. Let's restore this database. Imagine you are saying, okay, this is looking good. Maybe I can use it for development, so let's restore a database now. Um, I will connect to my container back again, and take a look at this. I am saying, all right, Please use this mount point for the data and this mount for, for the logs. Okay, let's do it. Done. And it's taking the backup from my share directory between the container and my computer. Let's query some data, making sure the human resources has data expecting and everything is fine. All right, so looking good. 
okay, or, all right, I maybe can use it. I want to, my developers to have access and maybe try out some, some stuff. So why not creating a login? Let's create a login for, for my development team and I will grant them some access to read data, to write data, all right? But also I need to protect this data because this is production, right? So I'll be using dynamic data masking to protect this data and mask the, the data so they can understand what they are seeing, but they will be able to work and develop the application because there will be names here, emails, so there is much information I don't want to share with them. Or my testers, it depends. Okay, so connecting to my container again, and I'll run this query, and it's done. Okay, so let's make sure it runs it works as expected. So I'm connected right now using the SA account. So I will switch my context of my session to use the development login I just created, and I will query data. And I will expect to see masked data, right? All right, so let's do it. Let me show you my session information here first. All right, so SA login name. Let's change the context to my development team, make sure the session is looking good, yeah. So now I'm impersonating this login. Let's query some, some data and make sure it's working. And it's, it, it is working fine. So my employee's information is protected and also the dependence because this is a human resources database so it has a lot of private data. So it's working fine. All right, so yeah, it's cool. I maybe can use this to do some development. So the next step will be to translate this, what I did manually, to create a custom image, all right? So let's do it. And before I, I do that, I will show you and prove you that the data is inside the container here. I'm not cheating. So everything is there, the data files and everything. So cool. All right, so let's move on to the second demo. This is getting better. This is kind of, the first one is basic. All right. The first thing I want to do here is to show you my folder structure. So I have a folder called, called demo2, and this is my script, the shell script I'm using here for this demo. But I have a directory called backups. Obviously, it's the backup I just take it from, from production and put it there. I have a folder called DVA, and inside DVA, I have created a file, .x file. You name it. You can put the name you want. And it will have the SA password. That will make sense later, I promise. And I have a, a, a script called SQL deployment and another script called entry point. And I'll explain you that in detail now. So what is entry point? When creating a container, you can manipulate the way this container starts. So I will create this entry point. I created this entry point script to manipulate what I want my container to do when starting. So. Let's take a look. So here is entry point. And entry point is going to receive a couple of parameters to run the SQL deployment. And my SQL deployment will wait for SQL to start. And that's why I'm kind, kind of concatenating this. I'm running the SQL deployment and at the same time starting SQL Server. But my deployment will wait some time, waiting for SQL to start and then start doing the deployment. But there are two parameters here, so where'd that come from? So let's take a look at my Docker file first. All right, so when creating a, a container image, you can reuse con images that already exist. And I'm using the CU16 from SQL Server 2017 here. That means I'm not creating net nothing from the scratch. Here's the environment variables that we have to pass. There's a password the end user license agreement, and I am having my, I am starting my, my SQL agent, of course, but here's the two customized environment variables that I mentioned. I am putting one to wait for SQL, 20 seconds to wait for a start, and then my deployment will kick off. And also, I have one that is called the environment, because I want to control if 
this container will be for development or stage, and I can take decisions, decisions based on those values, all right? And then, here's something really interesting. I am installing Git, Git into this container. And you will say, why? Why he's installing Git in a container? Well, the reason is, I will like remember that I did a manual thing, creating the logins and that stuff. I don't want to do manual stuff anymore. So I will use a SQL, uh, excuse me, um, GitHub repository that has my scripts. And I will be cloning this repository into my container so I will have these scripts anytime I build it. And also I am including two of the favorite community community monitoring tools like SP who is active and SQL Server first responder kit from Brand OSR. So whenever I deploy this container, these two Git repositories will be cloned into my container and those scripts will be ready for me to do whatever I want, okay? Then I will copy some scripts and this step is just simply going to copy those files from my deployment, the entry point and everything else that is here you saw it on the DVA directory, my backups and everything else. Nothing strange there. And finally, as I said, I will control what is going to happen when this container starts, okay? The entry point will wait some time. This parameter will be passed to the SQL deployment. We'll, we'll wait, let's say, 20 seconds. And let's imagine if I don't pass any, any parameter, we'll do it for the environment, for development environment, okay? So let's create this image. All right. Oh, wrong demo. Okay. So this build command is going to use my Docker file and it's going to build a local image in my computer and as you can see right now, it is installing some packages on, on, on this container. I'm using Ubuntu. So I will expect to install Git to get the, to install some of the tools that I define. And also it will clone those repositories. Though, so that will be ready and packed, as I said, the standard. And whenever I, I choose to use this, this container image, it will have everything I put here in place, right? So we will have to wait a little bit, maybe like 30 seconds. And I'm sorry, I have to do this live. And right now, it's almost finishing. So far, so good. So it's using the internet from here, so it's downloading packages from the internet. <laughs> Okay, almost there. People is leaving. Take a sip of wine. Well, that is taking longer than expected. All right. There you go. There is when when it's cloning those Git repositories into this container. As you can see, the DVA scripts are being placed on DVA, DV scripts underscore DVA and SP who is active is on git repos. That's the way I call this, this directory because I want to have control of what, about what the DVA scripts are and something else from a different source, okay? So it's done and I apologize that that took longer than expected. And right now I will expect to have this Docker image that I have created 11 seconds ago and it's one 0.5 gigabytes, and it has all those scripts, my database, so it's ready to roll. Let's try it. And this example will create the container for the developer environment, will wait 30 seconds for SQL Server to start, then it's going to perform the deployment. And I am concatenating this, this command with the slip command to wait a second and then check the logs of this container. So we'll see what is going on live. And it's doing, using my local image that I created a second ago. So right now it's going to wait 30 seconds for SQL. So SQL server will start. And then I will expect my SQL deployment to take care of 
what I choose to do. By the way, let's take a look at my, what this is happening. This is my deployment file. My deployment, and this is my deployment file. So my deployment will receive those two parameters, wait for SQL and environment. It's going to create a log. Remember about that X file that I mentioned? It's going to read the file contents and then it will put it onto a variable because I don't want to expose the, the, DV, the SA password here. You can choose a different user if you want, but I just did it, right? And here is something really interesting. I'm using functions here on this shell script because I want to make it scalable. So the first function is for the DVA part, DVA init, if you will. So it's going to create the database. I'm going to create a DVA database because I want to put all the um, SP who is active and first responder kit objects into this database, right? I, I will restore the database that I copied the backup from, from, from whatever the source was. I will create the logins, mask the data. And as you can see, I have different functions here for SP who is active for first responder kit, but I, when doing this, I realized that there was a problem with this model. Whenever I was going to stop this container and start it again, this deployment was going to be executed again. So I have to have some, some flag or something to make sure the deployment was not going to occur twice. So I created this file, this is a flag. So here's a validation that would say, if the file doesn't exist, start doing the deployment. So the, first, the very first thing it's going to do is wait for SQL to start, and it's going to do the deployment. Remember about the environment variables that I, I mentioned, here is a case. And depending of the value, is going to do something different. For example, for development, it's going to do the DVA in it because I need my DVA database, everything else, and it will create the SP who is active. For stage, it's going to do the SP who is active, DVA in it, and also the first responder kit. So I'm changing, manipulating what I'm doing depending on the environment. And here is a log validation, making sure there is no errors. And at the end, I'm creating um, a file where I said that this, this, this flag, if anything went fine, I would create this flag. And here is the if that I was mentioning. If the file exists, we'll do this. If not, just we'll wait for SQL to start. All right, so let's go back here. And let's take a look, this is done. So what happened was that SQL was started, then my, de de my deployment for the development environment was completed, my database was created, my logins was created, the data was masked, and everything else. But take a look at here, just this SP who is active, because that was, I defined my case that I just wanted those things. So let's take a look at stage. Let's have an example now where did it go? of creating this with the different parameters. So I will create it now with a different parameter here. Just a minute. And when running this command, I will expect my container to have a different deployment. I will expect to create SP who is active as well the first responder kit from random SAR. Okay? So that's kind of an idea of how you can manipulate and create different solutions depending on your environment. You can even create a pre-stage, you can create a production, you can have different options for your deployment. All right? So it's doing it right now, but I think we can, we can move on to something more interesting now. And oh no, it's starting now. It's doing the stage in it. You can see here it says a stage environment, different environment doing the restore. Right now it's waiting for the restore to complete the, the recovery. And take a look at it here. So the first responder kit was created. It wasn't for, for development, so it's cool, right? All right, so let's move on to something more interesting now. So imagine you are already using um, one of the images and you have your developer, there, we have a junior developer that he just started today. And somebody asked him, okay, let's please do some modifications to some location on the human resources databases. Please just grab the, 
the latest image published on, on, on our repository and start doing some work. Okay, so he will use Azure Container Instances. Azure Containers Instances is a serverless service that will allow you to create a container in the cloud and it, does, it will be running on the Azure infrastructure. It doesn't, you don't know where it is. You will define the, the region and, and everything, the location, excuse me, and everything, but it's there, running on the Azure uh, infrastructure, which is cool that you can stop at any time, but you don't have to invest in, in the infrastructure to have a SQL Server up and running. So it's just a matter to run this command. The um, only thing that would change here is that you have to define your CPU in memory. The minimum requirements for SQL Server on Linux is to have two, at least two CPUs and at least two gigabytes of memory. I will not create a container now because it takes some time, but it's there. It's up and running, and you can even check what is the IP, the public IP, what's the name or the DNS label, and I have it here. So I have my DNS label here, and I can connect from my computer now and run a query. As you can see, the query is returning me the top four of information of employees, and the, the data is, is looking good. Exactly what I defined on my image is the data is masked. All right, cool. So this new developer, he's really new, and he said, okay, I will run a couple of queries and I will do an update and just let me, con oh, let me connect from Azure Data Studio now. Here's my Azure Container Instances running. And let's... All right. So I will connect now. So this developer is really new. He's really junior. So he's doing an update of locations on the human resources database right now. And Don said, okay, I would like to query what is going on. Okay, so let's run this query. And as you can see, that would be really small, but the data is not being returned. And he will said, hey, Carlos or the DBA team, something is going on, I have the, I have, Run, I run this update to put some new data to a locations table and the queries are not working. Probably there is something wrong with the image or I don't know. So because we were really proactive and created a lot of things, a lot of tools on our containers, we can even create something like a SQL and an Azure Data Studio notebook and the notebook can have the instructions for this developer to run SP who is active. Because if you remember, we deployed that as part of our container and we put some login, we grant some permissions so this developer can even figure out what's going on. So he doesn't require lots of attention here for this, for this quick problem. So he can follow the instructions here but we all know what's going on. So let me connect to Azure, yeah, there you go. So. What is going on is there is a block. I don't know if you noticed that, but I leave the, the transaction open, and it says the blocking session is in number 54, and there is one block at session count. It was really easy, right? Because he already had those tools and this, this image, and he already has this pre-built notebook, and he can just save those results and send it to you and say, hey, you know what's going on? You have a block, and just kill this session, or you can do it yourself, but that's really convenient. You don't have to deploy that on the fly or, oh, let me look at the scripts and figure out what's going on. No, that's gone. That's so easy with this. All right, so I think that's it for now. Let's go back to the presentation. All right, so this second topic is SQL Server as an application component. And before I start, I would like to make a note this is just from the data perspective, or I would say it from SQL Server. I'm not touching development or anything else. Just saying how SQL Server fits on each one of these practices, right? So we have the traditional practice. 
And when using this practice, it's really common to find or have shared environments, which sometimes is not a good idea because it introduces risk to potential delays on the projects because there is some unexpected resource contention problems, all right? Traditionally, SQL Server will run everywhere in multiple environments like development, like stage, uh, you call it, right? And will, SQL Server will become a monolith service for, for those environments. It has to be treated as a production style environment. And we as DVAs are responsible to maintain that environment, to provide support, to keep the data in sync, and so on. So we know that's a very time consuming task, right? We all know that. And doing a deployment when using this, this practice, sometimes it's, complete, it's a little bit complicated. And not even to mention when you have to integrate things between the development and operations team, it's quite a challenge and time consuming because you have to coordinate all the moving pieces to make this effort just a single, single one effort, okay? Something happens, something different with contemporary practices because microservices has changed the way we ship and develop uh, software applications, all right? And one of the things that uh, is really important to understand here is the SQL Server is not a server anymore when using this practice. It's just a component that will provide you the database functionality to your application, okay? And in the past, we're working with, I don't know, to create a new development environment stage. It takes to wait for the VM to be created, uh, for the storage to be allocated, wait for uh, our Windows machine to be configured the way we want, waiting for, expecting to have all the best practices in place for, for VMware, whatever. And then you have to find the SQL Server installation media, you have to patch SQL Server. So it's a thing that can go from two to three weeks. I don't know, not everywhere, but I've been there. And, I mean, and it's a, a thing that goes and goes, right? So component management simplifies all this work introducing containers. And why? Because containers will separate your compute storage from your uh, f your compute, excuse me, layer from your storage layer. That means that you can have a SQL Server container that will have the binaries and you can have a persistent volume that will have all your data. So, for example, when doing a deployment or upgrading SQL Server to a later SQL Server engine version, will be just a matter to put up a new container with a new version of the SQL Server engine put down the previous container, do an instant switch over, and that's it. It's, it's really quick, really easy. All right, so speaking about SQL Server as a component, we can use a tool like called Docker Compose that will help you to define, configure, and put some characteristics of some deployments that you can do using a, a, a declarative file called uh, Docker Compose that uses YAML or JSON format to, to create a code. And you can even create containers on the fly using a Docker file. If you don't want to reuse an image that already exists, you can do it while doing this deployment. So you can see how your containers will integrate and it will be just a matter to run a command line instruction. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a demo and, and I will do a manual integration of SQL Server here. I will make a, a link between my SQL Server container, my application that will have a front end and, and back end um, part, all right? Right, let's close this down. Right, a quick note here that I had help from Giovanni De Leon from Guatemala. He's a young developer, very talented, that he helped me to develop the web 
front end and back end application. We were like a team. He was the development team and I was the operation team. And it was really amazing that I just shared the container image with him. He was able to do everything from there. So it was a proof that this works. Okay, so here is a folder structure for what I'm going to do. I have my HR app and I will have a back end and a front end. And the back end was developed using C, um, what's the name, .NET Core using C Sharp. And it's kind of an, a RESTful API. And I'll have my front end using Angular. And there is many files here inside each one of these folder, as you can see. So you can build these images if you want because everything is there. But for demo purposes, I will be using images that are already built. The most important thing here is to take a look at our to my Docker Compose file. And here is when, when all the integration is happening. So here's my front end, and I'm using an image that already exists on my, Git, on my Docker Hub repository. Um, because the front end needs to communicate to the back end, um, we are using some um, environment variable here to let the front end know which is the, the, the URL, IP address, you call it, of my backend, all right? And this backend will, it will, this front end will depend on my backend, and this is kind of a link. Docker Compose is going to create an internal network for this solution, and you will see it when I was, uh, I will be deploying it. And here's my backend, and something really interesting that we did, that we can manipulate the string connection and decide if we want to do a test to check the data when using a admin login that was the SA or doing it while using the development team login. So here I'm choosing to check the web application using the development login. So I will expect all the data to be masked, okay? And finally, this is going to use one of the images I already built and created and I have on my Docker Hub repository and that's it. So this is what I was talking about. Defining all your configurations here is, is simple and then it will be just a matter to run a command. So let's do it. Yep. And just running Docker Compose up should start the front end, the back end, and SQL Server. Right now, it's waiting for SQL to start. Remember, I have created this image that behaves that way, so that's kind of expected. In the meantime, All right, SQL Server should be starting in a second. Let me open a new bash. So yeah, it's done. The SQL Server image was created and it's integrated with my, my deployment. All right, so if I query this, when creating this, this container, I choose to use the 1433 port just because and if I do a test, I can see my container responding. Is, is if I query some data, I can see it. I'm, I'm seeing the mask data when using the development login. Everything is fine. So let's run our HTTP get to my API. I'm a RESTful API and it's working fine. So I will expect now to see a web-based application working fine. And let's take a look. Yep, the regions, the countries, the location. And this is a crude type of application where I can create, delete, update information. And remember I told you that I choose to see the data using the SQL login, the SQL development login and the data is masked. So everything is working the way I was expecting. And as you saw, it just took two seconds. It was so quick. And I'm re just reusing all the things that I already built. Okay? All right? So, I think I can go back here. All 
All right, so next topic is working with SQL Server containers on CI-CD pipelines. And the very first thing I would like to do is to define what is CI-CD. I, hopefully you guys are familiar with this, but CI-CD is just a method to deliver apps frequently to end users, end users introduction, introducing automation in all stages of the application and the development of the my application, all right? So CI stands for continuous integration. And as I said, it's going to commit all the data into a shared repository. It's going to trigger some builds. You will have some automated testing going on and it's going to complete everything and have everything ready. Then it comes the CD part. The CD stands for continuous deployment. That means that our operation teams will take over from there and will deliver and deploy those applications into a live production environment or maybe a their dev or stage environment, okay? And speaking about CI CD from the data perspective, it's a little bit different because web applications are stateless. Databases are not. Databases are stateful. And that means that we have to have a persistent storage. We have to have like volume that I was saying. We have to protect data as well. We don't want private data to be exposed in the development environment. And about the deployments, I don't know if you noticed, I, I use the scripts, but you can use a lot of things. There is a, a tool called Flyway from Redgate that will perform a database migration. There is entity framework that you can use to do an application slash database migration. You can deploy scripts into a container directly if you want, you can connect. You can create a job. So there is many options. I like to use this entry point way because I like to have control what's going on when my container is starting, okay? So speaking about CICD, there is a, a tool is called Jenkins. Jenkins is an automation server it, which is open source that will help you to build, to test, and ship those applications that you are building. And there is something that is called pipelines. Pipelines is, there are nothing more than a set of jobs that will break down your deployment by stages, and they will take the code from version control to the hands of the end users, introducing automation in all those stages. Okay, here's an example of how to use a deployment, uh, pipeline, excuse me, on a dev and test environment. So we have our happy engineer or happy DBA, well that's really difficult to find, but <laughs> let's call it happy DBA, <laughs> and, or DBA developer, that database developer. He's doing some changes on Visual Studio Code, and he's pushing changes into, a, committing changes into a GitHub repository, then we have Jenkins. Jenkins will take over from there and it's going to build that image and it's going to the, um, ship that image into a repository. For example, Docker Hub. And once that image is published there, or push it into this repository, my happy engineer can take from there, download a copy of that image locally and start doing some local testing or maybe just starting to develop a new feature of the application. So that would be really convenient. All right, so let's have a demo how to use a SQL Server container in a CI CD pipeline using Jenkins. Okay, and then this is going to be really quick. Okay, so. Here's my Jenkins, here's my script, so what I will be doing now is using my local repository that is in sync with my GitHub repository, and I will make some changes to my, my image, and those changes will be automatically deployed using a Jenkins. So I will expect that all the changes that I made will be there, and I can use that new image whenever I want, all right? So, Remember about the script, the, the GitHub repository that I was using at the very beginning. It was just a matter to create a database, to restore the database, and, and create some, some logins, right? For this version, version two, 
I'm creating a table for the who is active uh, monitoring. And I'm also creating a job because I want to, I don't know, for some reason I want to have control of the stage environment. I want to do some monitoring what's going on every 10 minutes, for example. So I will be creating this new version. And let me show you here. Here is my new version of the deployment. So here's the new version. Here's the new version of my deployment. And here's the DVA folder. And I have my current version, which is 1.1. And here's my new version, the 2.0. All right? So back here, I would like to show you what I did. So for this new version, I'm introducing a new function into my deployment script. And I call it dvmon, because I want it. So it's going to create the, the um, this is not looking good. Let me do it again. All right, this is better. So it's going to deploy the table that will hold all the data that will be collected by, by my SP who is active job, and that's it. It's not a big change, but I want to have control in my stage environment using that, all right? So let's list the files here. So you can see I have two, the existing, in the first version, and this is the second version. So I will do a switch. I will just rename the, the original to old and the V2 to the actual name of the original one. So right now, yeah, it's done. My change, I just switched that file. So if I add this into my GitHub repository right now, it would say that I did a modification. Well, was before. Okay, I'm committing the changes. I'm forcing my repository to do a push, and let's take a look at what's going on on Jenkins. So I will expect Jenkins to start doing a deployment in any second. All right, just started. Okay, what I did was um, a wet hook between my GitHub repository and Jenkins. So whenever I commit anything into my repository, Jenkins is going to trigger a build. And this build will be executed using a Jenkins pipeline. And here is my pipeline. The pipeline uses a Groovy um, code. And you will see here that I have uh, some environment variables. The first one is the name of my registry. Then I'm using a uh, plugin on Jenkins to let my job know that what, which credentials I'm using for this deployment. In this case, I call it Docker Hub. So everything is stored in Jenkins um, before doing this. And here's where the Jenkins is creating some local workspace cloning my repository, and here is where Jenkins is using the Docker plugin to build this image. And you can see here that it's using a um, local variable just to tag this image with the current build number. So I'll expect my new image to have the 49 number because that's the build number. You can manage it the way you want, but that was an easy way for me to do it. And then it will push the image into Docker Hub because I built it and it's ready to go. And then at the end, it's going to remove this image because if I don't do it, I will end up having a ton of images there on my, on my Jenkins um, server. By the way, my Jenkins server is an Azure. So pretty much of all this stuff is on the cloud. I'm just making changes locally but those changes are being pushed into a GitHub repository, and Jenkins is taking over and creating this image, and it's done. It took like one, one, two minutes. It's here. We can take a look at the logs, but what we're expecting right now is to have a new image into my repository will be, that will be tagged with the, name, with the number 49. So let's take a look. So it's done. checked, and here's a way to do it. 
So I can open my repository or I can query my repository and probably this is I'm sorry, I was just saving some space here. You can, you can control how you want to re this data to be returned. I was just, I just wanted to see the other 30 first records, but I have more than 30, obviously. This is the 49. So I have created this image on the fly, and I can show you here my Docker Hub repository that I'm not lying. <laughs> and 49 is here. It was created a minute ago. So all I did was fully automated. I didn't code everything. It was just a matter to save my, my, my late, latest changes into a, my GitHub repository, okay? All right, so. I have a last demo here. Right, so here's an example of what you can do on a production or a stage environment. Remember, everything I'm doing here is it was for dev or maybe uh, some local testing. But if you want to do something for production, it will be pretty much the same. But you will like to integrate this with a different um, platform. In this case, I'm introducing Kubernetes um, from Azure, which is called Azure Kubernetes Services. So. Jenkins is going to build my image, is going to push the image into a Docker Hub, and also is going to deploy that image into a Kubernetes cluster. So I will have HA uh, out of the box and more benefits of using this platform. So pretty much doing everything by itself, but my happy engineer will have access to this Kubernetes cluster using Microsoft Azure uh, or he can even use PowerShell or the Azure client or anything else to expose all those services that I will be creating on this cluster for my end users. So pretty much summarizing everything and, and putting all, all things together. So let's have a demo. Let's see if that works now. By the way, having some problems with some volumes in Kubernetes, hopefully it will work fine now. All right. Good. All right. I have a ton of Kubernetes clusters on, the, on, on Azure, so I'm just making sure I'm connected to my stage cluster, and I need some variables here. And by the way, Kubernetes is an open source container platform that will manage all my containers for me. So this, this platform will have HA capabilities, will have volumes that will be able for my containers to use. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a platform that, that will, it's kind of a, they, they call it an operating system for, for the data center. Well, you will put all your containers and you will forget about it. You need just to declare what you want because Kubernetes will make sure um, your deployments will be healthy. You'll have at least the amount of replicas you define up and running. So there is many moving parts here. I won't get in details here in deep on, on Kubernetes. There was a really good session of Anthony this morning. I hope you, you attended. So he, he did it really well there. But anyway, I will show you here. I have some services. So services will be those IP public, public IP that will be exposed to the internet for me to use. So I have my back end, my front end, and I have SQL. But I didn't create SQL yet because I will deploy it using, using Jenkins. So if I take a look at the deployments, I can see I have one for my back end and one for my front end. So there is no SQL yet. All right, so I will create the one for SQL now, but before I do it, I will show you something. Imagine that you were working with CU15 for a couple months, and then CU16 went out, was released, and you want to start 
testing it. So I will make a change to my Docker file that I have here. My Docker file is using CU15, and I will upgrade SQL, if you will, in this command. So I will change. I will switch SQL to use SQL CU16 here. And after the change, my Docker file will be using CU16. So I'll expect this new image that will be created in Kubernetes to use a different image that I had in the past for some reason. Okay, let's commit the changes. All right, done. In this case, I don't want, I didn't want to do an automated way. I want to do it manually. And by the way, I didn't, I forgot. I wanted to show you something before I move forward. Remember about the 49 image that we created before? I integrated Jenkins with Microsoft Teams because I want my development team to be page or notify whenever a new image is available for them to, to start working on it. And it's here. Here's the 49 that I created, and I can even take a look at the build. I can take a look at the console output and take a look at the log and everything that happened. Right? So this is really cool, really cool. And you can even integrate it with an email. So many options here. OK, so oh, let's go back here. And let's build the Kubernetes live. So here's my Kubernetes pipeline, and I'll start building it now. It will take a couple of minutes because it takes some time to create the, 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 the image. So if you want, we can take a few questions for now because we have a couple of minutes while this is finishing. So go ahead. Okay, so the question was, why I'm using Jenkins instead of user and Azure DevOps, right? Or any other tool. Okay, the reason is because I feel comfortable with Jenkins. <laughs> I'm still exploring Azure DevOps, but you are right. You can integrate this technology with any CI/CD tool. Azure DevOps does a really good, good job. At the end of the day, you will be using the images that you are creating, and you just need something to deploy those images for you, right? Or build it or test your, your images. So yeah, that, that was the reason. That was the only reason. All right, another question, anything? Go ahead. So your uh, Kubernetes cluster and everything, just how many nodes cluster is it? How many nodes I have? I have three nodes on this Kubernetes cluster, and if you want, I have three. I have the master, which is the brain of Kubernetes, and I have my workers here, one through three. So it's All right, so where the storage for my Kubernetes cluster is. That's, is that the question? All right. Okay, the storage. Okay, good question. Excellent question. So by the way, if you take a look at the, at the demos on my GitHub repository, you'll get access to all the deployments I did for the Kubernetes cluster. I have the deployments for the back end, the deployments for the database, for my, end, uh, for my front end, the services, and also the persistent volume. So Kubernetes use something that is a persistent volume claim. You create the, this volume, and in my case, I created this volume on, on 30 gigabytes, and this volume is presented to all my nodes. So whenever I deploy my SQL Server image into Kubernetes, this volume will be available for my deployment to use it, and will save those data files there. This is a really, Easy way to do it. Um, let me. This, no, I would say that very basic. And here's my deployment of Kubernetes. And I'm saying, okay, SQL Server, um, Kubernetes, please assign the volume called MS SQL DV, which will use the persistent volume claim that I just created. And, and you can create, the, you remember the, the example when using custom one point for data file, log files, and everything? You can do the same for Kubernetes. You can create one volume for your, your data, one volume for the logs, you, you call it. So there's many options here. All right, any other question? 
No questions at all? Okay. So I will move back to Jenkins and it's done. Oh no, this is, yeah, Kubernetes is done. So let's take a look at the log. And by the way, this deployment will, whenever my pipeline, let me go back to my pipeline here. All right, so here's my pipeline for, for Kubernetes. It's a little bit different because I will be using uh, Kubernetes cluster, so I have to create um, a user, and there is something called namespaces on, on Kubernetes. So I created um, Jenkins robot user to have access to my namespace and be able to deploy, be able to query my services and do some stuff. And in this case, I am applying a new uh, deployment, but this deployment should use the image that I created during this pipeline. Well, I was building the pipeline. And if we look at my backend here, you'll see that there is an environment variable called version. And this is because my pipeline is going to send that version back to the deployment here. I am doing a replacement of the environment variable called version and put in the actual build number that I'm doing right here. So I would expect my deployment to use the image tag with the number 40. Let's take a look. And it's here, right here. And there you go. So my deployment is using the image that I built as part of my pipeline, which is the number 40. And let's take a look at my pods here. And right now is creating the container. That's a little bit odd. Should be up and running by this point. And let's describe the pod. Right now it's attaching the volume. It says that the volume was attached to my container. So I have to spec is, is, is wait a little bit for my deployment to be completed. For some reason it's working really slow today. <laughs> Yeah, it was before, but right now it's, it's doing fine. So it, it, it was a timeout for the volume before, but right now it's doing fine. So I will expect my Kubernetes cluster to tell this deployment, okay, you are good to go with the node number three or whatever, but right now it says that attach, the volume was attached, for some reason is not creating the container. Well, that was really unexpected. But anyway, I have my front end up and running my everything waiting for this. So we can wait a little bit longer. I can move forward and let's go back. Hopefully it will be completed before I finish the presentation. So here's my example. Oh well, so session takeaways. So containers are cross-platform. If I create a container on my Linux machine, it will work the same on um, Mac OS machine, sorry. It will work the same in the Linux environment, on Azure, or even Windows. I don't know if you noticed, but my, 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 I told you, I don't know if I told you, but my Jenkins is a Linux VM on Azure. And it was able to deploy those images that I created on Mac OS. So it works the same. Standardization is a really cool thing about containers. You can create your base image for to have your monitoring in place, all your best practices and everything else that you need, and, and it will be packed and ready for you to grow from there. You will be creating new versions of your deployments and so on. SQL Server is not a server anymore. It's part of, of it's just a component, as I said. It is that component that will make part, it will be a building block of your deployments, right? When using these, these kind of contemporary practices, okay? Docker containers are really great for DevOps. Obviously, as gentlemen said that they're probably using for Azure DevOps. And they, this technology is automation driven. You will be really happy to automate a lot of things. And CICD is a really cool thing. You can treat your infrastructure as you treat your, you treat your applications because everything is infrastructure as a code, which is really cool. 
There is a lot of open source tools to help you to be successful with this technology. Here's a summary of some of the technologies I use during, during these demos. Some of them are open source, some are not, like Azure, for example. And if you want to take a look at some articles I have published about this topic, um, there is some in Simple Talk, some in, in SQL Server Central, MS SQL Tips, and here's my GitHub repository. You can download the demos from today. And questions, do we have more questions before we close? Oh, all right. okay, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, what? <laughs> Could you please repeat? Do I have any troubleshooting? Okay, I got it. So the question is, do you have to do performance tuning or troubleshooting because everything is back into container? Yes, because at the end of the day, it's SQL Server. As you notice, I did a block in purpose because I wanted to show you that you have the tools there ready to go and fix the problem immediately. But yes, it's just a normal SQL Server we, we are used to work with. It's a different platform, that's it. At the end of the day, SQL Server can run anywhere. <laughs> Very cool. More questions or anything else? Here we go. Excuse me? Security concerns, is there any security concerns about what, the images or SQL Server? Okay, great question. So, I don't know, well, when using Jenkins, for example, you have to have a user in the Kubernetes cluster to do the deployment, right? Because at the end of the day, it has to run commands. So my Jenkins user only has certain permissions that I define. And I defined I want this user to have only access, access only to my namespace called SQL Server because Kubernetes can have multiple namespaces. It's like a logical separator. You can have one namespace for SQL and one namespace for your application. And you can even control the granularity of all the permissions by namespace and actual actions. So in my case, I define the Jenkins user will have access just to the SQL Server namespace and will be able to deploy new, new and to create new deployments. Not services, not able to drop a pod or something like that. That's it. So there is a lot of isolation here. That I, I mentioned that, but containers can can allow you to run multiple um, SQL Server instances in one one box. But those containers won't see each, each other unless you want it. As I said, I created a read scale, and because read scale needs to see both hosts, I have to do some configurations on internal network between those two containers to make them available to each other. So there is many things you can control, but yeah, it's really secure. Go ahead. Excuse me. What kind of support? Active Directory, okay, so I think that's a really great, great question. Microsoft is working on it. I don't know the latest information about it, but they will be shipping that really soon. At this point, it is just SQL Server authentication. Yeah, but I can, I can take a look later and let you know. <laughs> Not for now. Not for now, but we can bug Bob Ward and ask him about it. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great question. Go ahead. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let me please go ahead. Exactly. I don't need to encrypt any state. When, when my container dies, I know it. But now the other one, so the Kubernetes service basically makes sure that the container is running properly. Okay, good question. So, yes, the service will route the Kubernetes 
no, Kubernetes will route my application to my service, right? The service is the IP, the public IP I will be using. So if one of my pods dies, Kubernetes will try to create, recreate the pod somewhere else, okay? And my service will take care of routing those connections to the new pod. And that's it. I think we have to close for now. We, we, can, we can talk here. Yeah, all right, of course. So thank you very much for coming to my presentation today. All right, thank you.